Rihanna Zunino Dennison was born on March 29, 1998, in Reno, Nevada. She was the daughter of Bridget Zunino Dennison and had a younger brother named Brighton. Rihanna grew up in a very loving family. It is said that her parents and relatives gave her good teachings about life. Her father, Jeff Dennison, passed away when she was just six years old. She loved children and animals, especially her dog Ozzy, and was known for putting other people's needs before her own. Brianna attended Reno High School and graduated there in June 2006. After that, her family moved to Mendocino, California, where Brianna joined the Faculty of Psychology, majoring in child psychology. According to her, it was thanks to therapy that she was able to overcome the loss of her father when she was just still a child, and that's why she chose this profession. Brianna was passionate about travel and enjoyed getting to know the cultures of other countries. As a child, she lived for a year in Rome, in Italy, and later, she got to know several other countries. According to her family and close people, she was very easy to make friends with and connect with people. In 2008, during her winter break, Brianna was visiting Reno, her hometown. She always had the habit of participating in a snowboard festival that took place every year in the city and used the occasion to visit family and see friends. On January 19, 2008, Brianna and her mother watched a movie together and then Brianna gave her a list of the events she intended to participate in that night and informed her that afterwards she would sleep at her friend Kate Hunter's house, already known to the family, Brianna's family. Brianna and Kate had been friends since high school and would always see each other when she was on vacation visiting the city. At around 9 p.m., Brianna said goodbye to her mother and went to meet her friend, after which they went to the festival. The first place the girls went was the Hotel Casino Saint Regency, very close to where Kate lived. Then, they took the bus to a show which was the main event of the night, and after the show, they went back to the hotel and had breakfast. This was the third year in a row that Brianna had attended these events. At around 4 a.m., they left for Kate's house in McKay Court and accompanied by four friends who dropped them off at the house and then left. At her friend's house, after putting on pajamas, Kate gave Brianna two blankets, a pillow, and a teddy bear to protect the pillow. Brianna slept on the leather couch downstairs by the door while Kate went to her room, which she shared with another girl upstairs. Kate took her dog with her and locked the bedroom door. The front door of the house was left unlocked, which was the girl's habit. Kate woke up around 9 a.m. and went to talk to Brianna in the living room, but she wasn't there. The friend looked for her all over the house but couldn't find her. After looking more carefully at the sofa where Brianna was sleeping, she noticed a small blood stain on the pillow and also noticed that all of Brianna's belongings were still there, such as shoes, cell phone, and her purse that contained money and her ID. Kate was very worried. It was very cold that morning, and it didn't make any sense for Brianna to have left without her things, without coats, and even less without shoes. Brianna was a very responsible girl, and would definitely let her friend know if she needed to go out at night for whatever reason. Kate then decided to warn Bridget, Brianna's mother, who soon after reported her disappearance to the local authorities. At the same time, the police began a major investigation into the mysterious disappearance of the girl. Posters with Brianna's photo began to be spread around the region, and they stated that Brianna was probably barefoot and dressed only in a white blouse and sweatpants. In testimony, Kate told the police that she didn't hear any noise after going to her room, and also said her dog didn't bark. In the following days, the Reno Police Department conducted a forensic investigation into Kate's home and found DNA on the doorknob belonging to a man who could not be identified as it was not registered in the police database. After some forensic analysis, it was confirmed that the blood on the pillow was Brianna's. Possibly, Brianna had suffered a wound near her mouth, throat, or nose as her face was pressed hard against the pillow. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry into the house, and one of the blankets Brianna was using was lying on the kitchen floor near the back door. The teddy bear that Kate had given Brianna to sleep was not found. The house was on a very busy street, and all the doors and windows were glass, and anyone looking into the house could see Brianna lying on the couch while she slept. No one had any clue where Brianna might be, and the police began to believe in kidnapping. Perplexed by the girl's disappearance and deeply concerned that no one had heard of her, Kate and Brianna's family members worked assiduously to help the police with the investigation. 
Analysis of Brianna's cell phone showed that she had sent and received multiple text messages in the period leading up to her disappearance, the last one at 4.23 a.m. It was later discovered that she was communicating with an ex-boyfriend who lived in the state of Oregon. Police emphasized that her ex-boyfriend was not a suspect as he was in Oregon at the time of her disappearance. On January 21, 2008, the day after her disappearance, detectives began searching the University of Nevada. They received help from the University of Nevada at Reno, the FBI, the National Center of Missing Children, more than 1,500 volunteers, and even the First Lady of Nevada, wife of the governor-elect at the time. Reno police continued their search for Brianna over the next few days, using search teams, dogs, and helicopters to search areas near the university and other isolated areas nearby, as well as a 24-hour hotline. Uniformed officers also went door-to-door -door throughout the neighborhood to find anyone who might have seen or heard something suspicious. Volunteers braved the harsh winter weather from northern Nevada to conduct searches in various areas, but all to no avail. Thanks to the efforts of Brianna's family, the disappearance quickly took on national proportions and the case was covered by America's Most Wanted, which has a large audience. The family managed to raise more than 160,000 in donations to cover the cost of DNA testing. Investigators later discovered that Mayo DNA found at the spot where Brianna was sleeping was related to at least two previous attacks in the same area. One on November 13, 2007, that involved a 21-year-old girl who was attacked by a man while walking home and the other on December 16, 2007, in which case the attacker attacked the 22-year-old girl and knocked her unconscious. She woke up a few minutes later with this man already on top of her. After the attack, she was taken home by the perpetrator. She couldn't quite see his face, but she provided enough detailed information for the police to sketch out what the suspect was supposed to look like. The victim told the detective handling Brianna's case that the vehicle she was forced into was an old model pickup truck with an extended cab. It had reclining seats, gray or black upholstery and carpet, and adjustable headrests. The truck had an automatic transmission and the victim noticed that the interior lights in the cabin were blue and were located above the rearview mirror. She also said that she remembered seeing a baby shoe on the floor of the vehicle and that it took a big step to get in due to the height of the truck. Detective Jenkins took the description of the vehicle to several local auto collision repair companies, but he found that several Toyota Tacoma four-wheel drive pickup trucks manufactured between 2001 and 2006 matched the description. On January 29, 2008, the police released a sketch and some more information about the kidnapper's characteristics and asked people to get in touch if they knew someone who looked like him. The man, when in his 20s to 30s, he was bland and wore a mustache and goatee. Later, another woman contacted the police claiming to have been attacked at gunpoint in October 2007 in the university parking lot. With the information she provided, the police made this composite sketch of the assailant available. All of these attacks had the same pattern, occurring at night and in the same region where Brianna disappeared. The police believed that since the other victims were alive, Brianna was likely to be too so the police began interviewing about 100 criminals registered in their database who were living less than a mile from the scene, but got no results. According to the authorities, it is extremely important to solve a case like this in the first 24 to 36 hours. At every hour, the chances of finding the victim alive decrease. On February 15, 2008, a man named Albert Jimenez was returning to work from his lunch break. As he walked down the road in a field near Reno Business Park, he noticed a bright orange fabric standing out among a pile of three branches that lay in a ditch. When he got closer, he discovered that the fabric was actually a pair of orange socks. What at first he thought was a mannequin turned out to be a woman's body. Albert had heard about Brianna's kidnapping, but he didn't think the victim looked like the pictures he'd seen on billboards. The man didn't have a cell phone with him at the time, so he went back to his place of work and called the police. The police quickly arrived at the scene and on February 16, 2008, after analysis, the autopsy confirmed that the body found was indeed that of Brianna Dennison, and the cause of that was strangulation. The report also concluded that her life was possibly taken the same night she disappeared. The place where the body was found was approximately 8 miles from Katie's house. A piece of underwear was found near Brianna's body, and the DNA of an unknown woman 
also found at the scene. Police said the item of clothing did not belong to Brianna and could have been left near her body to insult detectives. Authorities later discovered that the suspect had a fetish for underwear. They then asked anyone who recognized the garment as their own to come forward, as they could help to discover the identity of the perpetrator. After that, on November 1, 2008, police in the city of Reno received an anonymous tip that a 27-year-old man named James Michael Biella had been behaving very strangely since the crimes began. Detectives went after James and amicably asked him to provide a DNA sample, but he denied any involvement in the case and also refused to provide a DNA sample. The detective further noted that James was very nervous during the encounter, didn't make eye contact with him, in addition to the fact that he worked near the university campus as a plumper, but when asked about this, he denied it. That meant that day Brianna disappeared, James was living in the area. With this rather strange attitude, James became the prime suspect and it was not only a matter of time before the police were able to clear everything up, but with no physical evidence against him, the detectives had no choice but to let him go. Before we continue, I'm going to talk a little bit about James Biella. James Michael Biella was born on June 29, 1981 in Chicago, Illinois. At the age of 9, he moved with his family to the city of Reno. He later became known as a funny guy who took martial arts lessons but he was also known to have a quick temper and some described him as a bully. After high school, he joined the Marine Corps and was promoted to rank of spare corporal, but was discharged in 2001 for doing drugs. In 2002, back in Reno, James was arrested after threatening his ex-girlfriend's neighbor with a knife. His ex-girlfriend filed a restraining order against him, and he pleaded guilty in April 2003 to a misdemeanor count involving the knife incident. James was sentenced to alcohol counseling and then sentenced to not have contact with the victim for a year, but no DNA samples were taken because the action was only a misdemeanor. After previous run-ins with the law, around 2002, he moved in with his new girlfriend, Carlene Harmon, in Sparks, east of Reno, and they had a child together. Neighbors described him as a nice, normal guy, and no one noticed anything peculiar about him not even the police officers who trained with him in martial arts classes. Returning to the case, on November 12, investigators met with Carlene, James' girlfriend. During the conversation, they asked several questions about the boy, including where he was on the dates when the previous crimes took place. She explained to the investigators that the relationship was quite troubled and that James used to sleep outside for days, using his truck as a kind of home. Carlene also said that it was a friend who made the report to the police. She told this friend that she had found women's underwear in James' truck when they were driving back together from Washington State, Seattle, in March, where James had gotten a job as a plumber. The girl said that when she confronted him about the garments, he said he had stolen them from a woman in lodge room in Washington. Carlene also said that James had recently sold his truck in Seattle and already had another vehicle. The police managed to locate this vehicle and took it to Reno for a forensic examination to be carried out. James' girlfriend agreed to give them a DNA sample from their son, who was four years old at the time, so they could compare it to the DNA collected in the crime scene. The analysis indicated that the child's DNA was similar to the one found, which meant that the person responsible for the crime was a direct relative of the boy. On November 25, 2008, Reno police obtained an arrest warrant for James Biella. He was arrested at his son's daycare when he arrived to pick him up. James was taken to Asheville County Jail charged with numerous crimes. With James arrested, investigators obtained a court order to collect his DNA, and at a press conference held by the Reno Police Station on November 26, 2008, it was said that James' DNA matched the one found at the crime scene, positively associating him with the crime that victimized Brianna Dennison and the three previous cases. Kathy Lavelle, James' mother, said during his trial that her son had a traumatic childhood due to his father being an alcoholic and aggressive. Defense attorneys used this to their advantage and said that the defendant was a productive member of society before the crimes and that he was an exemplary prisoner. Jurors didn't accept his arguments, and on June 2, 2010, after nine hours of deliberation, James Biello was found guilty on all accounts and sentenced to death. On July 30, 2010, Judge Robert Perry sentenced James Biello to four additional life sentences. He appealed to the Nevada Supreme Court several times in an attempt to avoid a death penalty, but his appeal was denied each time. Today, 
James Michael Biela awaits his execution at Eli State Prison in Nevada. The crime, in addition to shocking the Australian region, also led its residents to buy several weapons in order to protect themselves. According to some gun shop owners around the University of Nevada, sales have tripled not just for firearms, but also for bladed weapons and pepper spray. The crime also resulted in a law that was passed in the state of Nevada called Brianna. This law obliges anyone arrested for any crime to have their DNA recorded in the police database, so if that the same person responsible for more serious crimes in the future leaves their DNA at the scene, they can be identified and arrested more quickly. People passing by where Brianna's body was found often leave flowers in her honor. In February 2008, a tribute to the young woman was made at the Reno Sparks Convention Center. Brianna's family created the Bring Brie Back Foundation, which is represented by Blue Ribbons, whose mission is to use all available resources to help the community and their families increase in awareness about violent crimes, personal safety, and ensuring justice. There is nothing that will feel the void left in Brianna's family, but at least the assured criminal will spend the rest of his days in prison. Well, folks, that's it. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Best wishes, and I see you next time.